Invasive fungal infections are a serious threat to critically ill patients. In fact, the prognosis is often poor, especially when the treatment is either inappropriate or delayed. And unfortunately, our current diagnostic tools aren't always up to the task. That's not the end of it, though. Excessive use of antifungals can lead to side effects, higher costs, and even the emergence of more pathogenic fungi. It's a tightrope walk between treating the disease and avoiding these complications. This is a crucial discussion that could change the way we approach critical care. So stay tuned, subscribe if you haven't already, and let's dive right in. When it comes to improving antifungal stewardship, the use of fungal-specific biomarkers for early diagnosis is crucial. One such biomarker is 1,3-beta-D-glucan, or BDG for short, a component of many fungal cell walls. BDG is often used in the diagnosis of invasive candidiasis, either as a standalone test or in conjunction with other biomarkers. However, its effectiveness as a singular antifungal stewardship tool is still being studied. BDG shows superior diagnostic performance compared to bedside clinical prediction models and colonization indexes, especially in settings with low pretest probability. However, there are cases where false positive results can occur, which can decrease the overall specificity and positive predictive value of the test. A recent multicenter randomized trial studied a BDG-driven strategy and found that despite its use, there was no notable survival benefit. Moreover, there was a high probability of antifungal overuse without actual candida infection in patients carrying a low risk of invasive candidiasis. On the flip side, data from two randomized trials support the use of a biomarkers-driven strategy as a rule-out diagnostic tool. This strategy allows for a safe and prompt interruption of antifungals in patients without mycological confirmation of invasive yeast infection. This method is currently included in the guidelines. Now, let's talk about another biomarker, galactamanin or GM. This is a key biomarker for diagnosing invasive pulmonary aspergillosis in critically ill patients. Interestingly, severe viral pneumonia, such as those caused by influenza and SARS-CoV-2, is associated with aspergillus identification in bronchoalveolar lavage. Yet, such patients are often treated with anti-mold drugs, even without true invasive infections, raising many concerns in terms of ecological pressure and potential toxicity. Because of the clinical utility of aspergillus biomarkers and the limited availability of daily GM testing, new rapid diagnostic tests were developed. Aspergillus lateral flow assays, though still limited by low specificity, have been recently introduced as point-of-care tools for early diagnosis and antifungal therapy optimization. It's clear that biomarkers are critical in the fight against invasive fungal infections. But, just like everything else in medicine, they're not perfect. They're tools that need to be used correctly, thoughtfully, and in the right context. Now, let's delve into the concept of de-escalation of antifungal treatment. By definition, it's either a switch from initial antifungals, except fluconazole, to triazoles, or discontinuing the initial antifungal treatment within five days of starting it. In a key multicenter observational study conducted by Bai and colleagues, it was reported that the incidence of antifungal de-escalation was 22% among non-neutropenic critically ill patients. What's noteworthy is that although de-escalation of antifungal treatment was linked with a shorter duration of treatment, it didn't negatively impact the outcomes. A similar finding was reported in a single-center retrospective study by Jafal and colleagues. Interestingly, they found that invasive mechanical ventilation was independently associated with lower rates of de-escalation. Yet, regardless of the de-escalation, there were no significant differences in the duration of invasive mechanical ventilation, length of ICU stay, ICU mortality, or one-year mortality between the two groups. However, it's crucial to note that these studies were observational. The physicians probably de-escalated antifungal treatment in patients who were showing improvement. So, further randomized controlled trials are needed to confirm these results. De-escalation has also shown potential cost savings associated with improved clinical success rates when treating invasive candidiasis in patients at risk of azole-resistant infections. A recent large observational study reported an early de-escalation rate of 23% in patients with candidemia. 
Early de-escalation was more common in certain scenarios, yet less frequent in others. And importantly, it was not associated with mortality after adjustment for confounders. The current European Society of Clinical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases or ESCMID guidelines strongly recommend de-escalation after receiving microbiological results. But remember, all these studies have evaluated de-escalation in patients with suspected IC. There's a lack of studies on de-escalation of antifungal treatment in patients with suspected aspergillosis or in immunosuppressed patients. Let's now explore other methods to improve antifungal use in critically ill patients. Therapeutic drug monitoring, or TDM, has been suggested as a method to adjust for variability in antimicrobial pharmacokinetic, or PK, related in part to patient covariates. The benefits of TDM-guided dosing have been shown in the use of voriconazole and are now recommended as routine in critically ill patients. Candida T2 magnetic resonance, or T2MR, is a recent development in the detection of suspected candida bloodstream infection. While T2MR is faster than blood cultures, its accuracy is reported to be moderate. However, T2MR has been shown to identify bloodstream infections that were missed by blood cultures in patients receiving antifungal therapy. So, it may improve care by shortening time to candida detection and species identification. Interestingly, a large cohort study found that the presence of an infectious disease physician was associated with lower total inpatient antibacterial use and reduced consumption of broad-spectrum antimicrobials. No specific data are available on the impact of an on-site infectious disease physician and antifungal use, which suggests a need for future studies in this area. A systematic review of 13 single-center studies on antifungal stewardship programs concluded that these interventions can improve performance measures and decrease antifungal consumption without negative impact on outcomes. However, there were several limitations in these studies that preclude definite conclusions. Lastly, it's important to remember that fungal colonization is common, and positive urine or respiratory specimen for fungi should not be treated with antifungals in the absence of signs of systemic IC or IPA. As we wrap up our deep dive into antifungal stewardship in critically ill patients, let's distill our key takeaways. Firstly, antifungal stewardship, or AFS, can improve performance measures and decrease antifungal consumption without negative impact on outcomes. Secondly, biomarkers like BDG are helpful in stopping unnecessary treatment in patients with invasive candidiasis, but they probably should not be used to initiate antifungal therapy in patients with a low probability of IC. Thirdly, de-escalation of antifungal treatment is safe and should be performed in critically ill patients. Fourth, routine therapeutic drug monitoring is recommended in patients receiving voriconazole. Finally, the accuracy of candida T2 magnetic resonance in diagnosing invasive candidiasis, and the role of infectious disease physicians in better use of antifungals in the ICU, are areas that need further evaluation. The exploration of antifungal stewardship is a testament to the dedication of researchers and healthcare professionals in improving patient care. There's much more to discover and understand, but every step brings us closer to better outcomes for critically ill patients. Thank you for joining us on this journey. Stay curious, stay informed, and as always, let's continue to drive the conversation on critical patient care forward. Until next time.